Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I know we said 9 o'clock. We're a couple minutes past. My apologies. But we do want to get uh, kicked off here with the presentation portion of this, uh, of, of our morning. And uh, I just, first of all, can't thank you all enough for taking time out of a, a Thursday morning, getting into the, uh, the holiday season already, and just taking the time to come and, and be with us today. And we certainly hope that you'll take something away from this. If nothing else, just some encouragement that uh, this is a solution-based morning. We're looking at talking about some, some real things that can create change, that can create solutions uh, in this housing space, which we know has become such a massive issue. So um, again, thank you. We want to thank our hosts, the Hilton. Uh, wonderful job. Breakfast buffet was excellent. So round of applause to them and the staff. Uh, I, don't, I gotta say uh, thanks to Nick in the back, all the AV stuff. I probably drove them crazy um, getting the uh, audio visual together. But as you can see, they've had everything set up for us this morning, so they did a terrific job. Uh, but uh, getting us started this morning, if you all wouldn't mind, rise. We're going to uh, start the meeting with a pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. And I probably didn't even introduce myself, so I'll start there. My name is Michael Puhala. I am the executive director of the uh, Collier County Community Land Trust. And again, we're so honored to have you here today. Joining me on stage and uh, will be part of the presentation this morning are Stephen Ruby, our board president, and Eileen Connolly Kiesler, uh, the CEO of the Community Foundation, Collier Community Foundation. Everybody's going to have a piece in bringing that level of encouragement and excitement surrounding housing. So uh, we're excited to get into uh, to that portion. But first, I wanted to uh, introduce Mont-Claude Nestor with PNC Bank. As you can see on our title slide there, they were gracious enough to help sponsor our event this morning. So he'd like to uh, present a few words this morning. So Mont-Claude, it's all yours. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Well, my name is Mon Claude Nestor, and I'm the Community Rede Development Relationship Manager for Florida at PNC. I'm just thrilled to, hear, to be here today to experience this housing forum firsthand, and I'm excited to be part of the work that the Collier Community Land Trust is doing to increase awareness and devise solutions for affordable housing in Southwest Florida. At PNC, we know our success is directly proportional to the strength of the communities where our customers and employees live and work. That's why our community development banking team's working to boost the quality of life in low and moderate income neighborhoods through financial education, grants, sponsorships, consumer products, and community development lending, as, long as, as well as investing in economic development. We also align with community organizations with foundation grants and charitable sponsorships to help bring their missions to life. In 2021, we announced our community benefits plan, which will provide $88 billion in loans and investments and other financial support over the course of four years to bolster economic opportunity in low to moderate income neighborhoods as well as communities of color. In 2022, in the first year of our plan, we engaged with community partners and provide community-based financial education to originate $25 billion in residential mortgage loans and home equity loans, which impacted more than 20,000 low to moderate income people. We originated $5.2 billion in loans to support small businesses in majority minority census tracts and particularly businesses with less than a million dollars in revenue. We've also invested almost $5 billion in affordable housing, economic development, neighborhood revitalization, and community services projects in traditionally underserved communities. And finally today, we've contributed about $120 million in charitable giving and philanthropic grants to help drive impactful change across communities. We've also partnered with community land trusts across the state to provide resources such as grants, financial education, and loans. Taken together, all these initiatives underscore our commitment to helping all populations and communities to move forward financially. And on behalf of PNC, I want to say thank you all for everything that you do um, to support low to moderate income folks as well as um, find a solution for this affordable housing issue in Southwest Florida as well as particularly in Collier County. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. One thing that I forgot to mention um, that you'll see at the after we get done with Eileen's comments um, regarding the foundation and all the tremendous things that they're working on for housing, 
We had uh, presented, we, we had hoped to have Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo here to present her with the Housing Champion Award for all of the work that she has done, dedicated her, uh, her time in the Senate to, on working on housing, and it culminated in the Live Local Act. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today, uh, but unfortunately, uh, th th they, they weren't willing to stop the legislative session for our <laughs> meeting this morning, so uh, she's in Tallahassee, but did send a video uh, to uh, accept the award. So uh, we will be playing that and uh, look forward to hearing her comments. So if you were at our annual event last year, um, December 9th, we had a presentation and I, I went back and talked a lot about the history of the land trust. I'm not gonna do that today. We're not gonna bore you with all of the details of how we got going. But if you're new and are interested, the video is still on our website. So you can certainly go in, check that out, and, and kind of get to know the history of how we became an, an organization. Um, but today I just wanted to touch on what is a community land trust? Because if you did hear it last year, you may have forgotten. Or if you're new, maybe you don't know exactly what does a community land trust do. And it, and it works in, in, in a lot of different capacities. Uh, but it is a, a separate uh, individual nonprofit organization. So. Uh, it, it is a community-based organization. We partner with a lot of individuals and entities, but the foundation is ensuring stewardship of land. Uh, land trusts can be formed and, and can actually conduct development in a lot of different spaces, but obviously it's designed primarily for housing affordability, uh, to ensure permanent housing affordability. The trust acquires land and then can work with uh, individuals on a 99-year renewable ground lease, so that locks it up in perpetuity. Uh, but the other thing that we're going to focus on a little bit today is a community land trust can also uh, lease land to developers of multifamily. So we're talking in the rental space uh, and be engaged in, in that phase of development as well. It can also even just be a co-developer. So we don't necessarily have to have ownership of the land. So there's some latitude and some flexibility and, and we hope to be able to engage in a number of different ways within the community to help support development of long-term or permanent affordable housing. So I wanted to introduce my amazing board of directors. Um, I think we got most of them around the table here. Obviously, I've already mentioned Stephen, who's our board president, but we have Mary Jo Deagle with us, who's our vice president. Please rise when I mention your name. Todd Sabins, our treasurer. <laughs> Cynthia Valenti-Smith is the secretary. Where did we lose David? David Ellis, I saw him. I know, he, there he is. He's at a separate table. Uh, our director, Jenna Bazako forrester I know a lot of you know. Uh, on the board, Michelle McLeod also, yes, and then Sean Murphy. So I know sometimes it's a crazy ride, but I can't thank you all enough for the support and the time commitment because this started in 2020. Um, it was a, a, it sounded like a great dream, but I think as we can see the number of people that are in this room today, the number of people that have engaged with me, the, the need continues to grow. And I think we are moving this thing forward in some really, really exciting ways. Uh, to become a catalyst for change. So thank you for that, the, the time commitment that you make. All right, so now I'm gonna jump directly into our first project uh, that we were able to get involved with. And uh, I know we've got Nick and, and Bill from McDowell Housing Partners in the room. They were able to come over and join us today, so I thank them for that. Uh, we had an opportunity to get involved as, a, as the general partner in an affordable senior rental development. Uh, started probably back in 2020, 2021, we, we probably became engaged uh, working through the paperwork, got through all the financial closing. This is a low-income housing tax credit development uh, specifically geared to individuals 62 plus. So it is a senior community. It is independent living. So it's, it's able-bodied uh, individuals that do not need assisted living care. Um, and the first phase, it's two separate phases, the Allegro phase and the Cadenza phase. They are sister uh, phases, they're sister buildings. So they each will have 160 units. And the uh, we're excited that the first phase, Allegro, should be completed hopefully at the beginning of the year. We're hoping February to have some occupancy. I know a lot of people have been asking me, when do we know when the portal is going to open? I will email my network when we have more information. We'll be working with a new property manager that will be in charge of that application portal. And so I will make sure that that information gets out to the individuals that are within my network. And if you are uh, interested in knowing more, you can certainly grab my card and email me about this particular project. But some of the key benefits here, this is ideally located. It is in the Hacienda Lakes Community District, so it is just east of 951 Collier Boulevard on Rattlesnake Hammock Road. And uh, it's going to have a lot of the amenities you would see in a, uh, in a market rate development. Swimming pool, it's got a lot of green space for walking. Um, there's a community center with a fitness center. 
Something that we're very excited about is we were able to make some connections with county staff in the Senior and Veteran Services Division, and they're going to bring their county uh, senior feeding program on site. So we're hoping to deliver hot probably breakfast and lunch Monday through Friday right downstairs in, in the uh, Allegro phase. Uh, and the developer was willing to make some accommodations to give space uh, to the, the county office to be able to run this program. So we were very thankful for that. And we've also made a connection with Healthcare Network of Southwest Florida to bring their mobile clinic on site uh, throughout the year to provide immunization services and basic exams. So health services feeding, these types of um, wraparound services, we're very excited when we can make those connections, uh, especially when we're dealing with, with the senior population. So Cadenza, we hope, will be following also 2024, probably in the late summer, early fall. Um, so in total, 320 units, 100% affordable. Um, and what that means is that every unit that is in this community, in this development, will have an income cap of 60% of area median income. And there's a corresponding rent rate that goes with that. So I don't, hopefully the chart is visible. Just thought I'd give you some context. Based on the 2023 figures, um, there's two categories because there is a 10% set aside for individuals that are extremely low income. Uh, and that flows down to 30 to 33% of area median income. Uh, but we, just to give you some idea, what does that look like from a rent perspective? So those extremely low income units, there would be approximately 11 one bedrooms at 561 per month in rent based on the 23 numbers. And then 81 bedrooms uh, for individuals that are up to 60% of our area median income. So there you're looking at rents 1123. Uh, two bedroom units, eight at 674 for that extremely low income set aside. And then an additional 61 two bedrooms at 1348. If anybody knows anything about the current rental market, these are obviously significantly below market rate rents. Uh, brand new, a lot of amenities. So we're excited. This is the type of development that we think uh, is impactful in our community. And it is, it's a part of what we need. It's not everything, but it is a piece because there is definitely a segment of the population, both senior and in the workforce, that are not able, to, that don't earn enough to be able to qualify at, at the higher rent rates um, that are currently going on in the market and even at some of those 80 and 100% rates. So th these types of developments have a, a definite need in our community. We have some renderings. We also have a poster board outside uh, by the table. So certainly take a look. As you can see, this looks just like a market rate development. When it's finished, you won't know the difference, I can promise. Um, excited to see where we're at, and, and this was as of August. So uh, the picture on the far left, that is the uh, existing uh, Allegro five-story building, um, starting to put the facing on the way it looks, but I was really excited about photos of the interior. Once you start getting bathroom finishes and, and cabinets in the kitchens, that means you're getting close. So um, very excited about the progress. What does the Community Land Trust do? What is our role in all of this? Well, we act as a project liaison and representative for the community. So again, if anybody that has questions, I'm always here to answer those um, through the Land Trust. We, we did help provide a lot of the market research and uh, we're dealing with tenant outreach. Individuals I know are already reaching out, community partners and individuals that are looking for uh, information on when this will be open. That's a service that we can provide. We're, we hope to assist the management company. Uh, again, there's a new manager coming on site that we're going to be meeting with shortly. Uh, and, and we can help identify and implement tenant services. We talked about some of the programs and that's again a big plus. How can we bring in some community partners and deliver additional services on site? And finally, we hope to help with identifying and income qualifying the potential tenants. This is a, uh, a future project, something we have been working on again with McDowell. Um, they, they happen to have a site that they were interested in and, and have some control over and they said this might work for our surtax program. So we are right now in the process, this is a, uh, Still uh, something that we hope to come together. Um, this would be a family style multifamily development, so it does not have the age restriction. This is more workforce. Um, somewhere between 108 up to 160 units potentially on the site, depending on, on where density lies, and that's open for some conversation as we work through the process. But where this is unique, um, we hope that there may be an opportunity to, to utilize the county surtax program, and this would be for land acquisition. So we're in the process of bringing this forward. I believe November 28th, we'll have a meeting with our Affordable Housing Advisory Committee to present, and then moving forward, have the opportunity to bring this forward to the Board of County Commissioners. If approved, then the county would own the parcel of land, do a 99-year ground lease, so then there's that ownership and that permanent affordability, and some control over uh, some of the design aspect and the, and the build. 
So that's unique in that this is a fairly new process. We're working to get through um, and hopefully be able to implement and utilize that, that funding source. And then also the, the Live Local Act, because this is a commercially owned proper, or zoned property, we would try to apply that automatic uh, use of multifamily housing on commercial space. So uh, two new things that the uh, resources that are both at the county level and the state level, if it all comes together, you could see how it can create a development. Um, same type of income and rent restrictions. This one would allow incomes up to 80% of area median, but it has to income average to 60%. So you're gonna have a nice mix of lower income up to 80, which is uh, getting closer to the moderate income. Uh, and again, permanent affordability through the ground lease. Some future projects. Uh, we have a couple of our uh, friends from Habitat in the room, and we are we're working hard right now on our first home ownership project, which we hope to uh, break ground on in 2024. If all comes together, be looking at a, a, a four-unit townhome project, and uh, it just will give us an idea and a pilot program that we can replicate. Uh, so we're not only working in the rental space, know that we are certainly going to try to help uh, develop homes that are affordable by taking the cost of the land out of the equation. Obviously, you can, you can uh, buy more affordably. Uh, and so that's the concept. There is some sharing of equity. There's some caps on who, who that individual can sell the property to. So it stays permanently affordable uh, in inventory. So we're gonna continue to explore how we can do more of that. Um, we're, we're looking at something called a housing navigator program. Uh, Cause that's I think what we need. There's so many questions, both from a consumer standpoint, but also the development community. How do we navigate uh, the process within the community and, and, and the county and some of the resources that they have available. How can we get this out, get the word out and, and help to implement? And so that's uh, something that I truly want to uh, make an initiative for 2024 is to help get this thing designed and figure out exactly how we're going to help every individual that's in the process, uh, ultimately helping the individuals and the consumers who need housing. And we wanna support the Live Local Act, the implementation. So. Uh, Steve's going to actually talk about a, a presentation that we hope to have late January and be a part of um, to, to help get Live Local a, a better understanding within the community, but also with the implementation. And the last piece that I have on my slide is the formation of something we're called the Housing Alliance. We gave you a nice takeaway piece, but I'm going to turn it over to Steve, and he's going to tell you what it is, what we're doing, and where we're going. Okay, how do we run this, Michael? That one moves it, okay. We're gonna trip over each other. <laughs> Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, how many of you were here last year to hear our spiel? Okay, if you remember one of the things that I said is when we formed this organization in 2020, during the pandemic on a Zoom meeting, uh, and uh, they pointed at me and said, you're gonna be the chair, or the president. I said, well, Five-year plan. We'll have our first development in the ground in five years. We had our first development in the ground in 18 months. <laughs> and we're, what else I told you last year is uh, I gave you a little teaser that we were going to roll out a new organization, a new nonprofit uh, that merged a couple of not only the land trust but help and added a, a more robust um, philanthropic and advocacy and education element to it. And I gave you a teaser and I said, by next year when I come before you, we'll, ha we'll have that in place. Well, we're about 60 days away from it. Uh, and it's called the Housing Alliance. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what it is, why we're, how we got here over the past year, uh, and why you should be excited about it because I think it's going to be uh, kind of the, a, a, a hub for all things housing in Collier County. Um, <clears throat> What it is, it's another 501c3. Is that on screen? Yeah, okay. Uh, it is another 501c3 organization, uh, which we are probably about 15 days away from having it official, uh, the name officially uh, registered for a 501c3. Uh, and what we're gonna be doing is serving, we're the go-to. Uh, I mean, I used to call us the hub uh, for all things housing, all the resources uh, both for the community and for uh, the development community and for government um, in Collier County dealing with housing that's affordable. Uh, we don't like to use the term affordable housing, and housing that's affordable. Uh, as I was telling a couple of folks when we were discussing during, before breakfast, I said, uh, what's been happening is our, our housing uh, costs have been doing this, household income is doing that over the past um, you know, th three to five years. 
So where your affordable, your affordable need was, was on the lower end of the economic spectrum. It has now creeped up all the way to upper middle income. So the numbers have grown and the, the, the demand and the need has, has sprawled, particularly here in Collier County. So that's why we say it's housing that's affordable or housing that's attainable that what we're striving for. Who do we serve? Homeowners, renters, developers, local government, funders, donors, and the community at large. Uh, so we, you know, we're about all things housing to all people. Uh, that's what we, we, we hope to be. It's aspirational, um, but that's kind of what our mission is going to be. Uh, we're really a strategic alliance, as I said, between uh, Collier County Community Land Trust and HELP. HELP deals with the soft side. We call it the soft side. It's the people side. It's counseling people. It's dealing with foreclosures. It's dealing with mortgage assistance. It's dealing with uh, all the things that the consumer needs to get into either rental uh, or uh, um, uh, home ownership situations. Uh, and Collier County Land, uh, Community Land Trust, as Michael just told you what we do, it's about land, it's about acquisition, it's about uh, development. It's about the bricks and sticks. So you get the people side, the bricks and sticks side. When we formed the Housing Alliance, or started to form the Housing Alliance, what we were missing uh, really was an educational uh, and a advocacy group to, to, to reach out to the community and to government. And we also thought the philanthropic community, you gotta realize, N Naples and Collier County, uh, problems were, are solved here. You know, over the history, we're 100 years old, both the county and the city. Um, and Ray Christman's in the audience here, someone he can attest to this, because uh, this is one of the history lessons uh, we all got from the city when they rolled out their uh, centennial program. Uh, major problems in, in this area have been solved uh, by the wealth, by the high wealth uh, community here. And what we're seeing is that uh, you know, wealthy individuals are looking to try to help us solve that problem, okay? And Eileen is gonna probably uh, if, if give you a little bit of teaser about how, how that is working for us all. So, um, all right, how, how do we get here? Uh, what's happened over the past year? Uh, as I said, we formed our strategic alliance between the two nonprofits. And we also formed a strategic alliance with the uh, uh, Collier Community Foundation. Eileen and Lindsay and her staff have been immensely helpful to us, uh, just in advice, in kind of mentorship as what a nonprofit uh, at, at this scale should be doing. Uh, she uh, teamed us up with a wonderful consulting team, Impront, and Mark and Bob from Impront are here with us today, and they have been excellent in helping us form our business strategy, our business plan, uh, and move, our, move this agenda for, uh, forward. So we really, I want to give them a round of applause. Um, we've held, the, this is, was Mark's idea, that we've held several strategic uh, stakeholder meetings. I think we had three of them, Mark? Yeah, three of them over the past nine months. Uh, and there were stakeholders, people were interested, and some of you who are in this room have attended that, those stakeholder meetings to try to get input from them and to try to get them to be uh, more engaged in what we were doing. It was a dialogue, it was a, uh, it was a conversation about the problem and solving the problem, not just complaining about the problem. We're here for solutions. Uh, the Housing Alliance is here to be sure that we begin to put uh, bricks on, uh, on the ground, we're building units and not just complaining about the problem and uh, trying to identify. We know what the problem is. It's a matter of, uh, of, of solving the problem. Uh, we've uh, hired a legal counsel. We have legal counsel putting up together all our bylaws and our, uh, getting us perfectly in place for, for, for the organization. And we've hired a marketing firm uh, to deal with our marketing and branding uh, for, the for the organization. Um, I call this a soft rollout. We're explaining it to you. Um, we leave, if, as you're leaving, we have a, a you know, one page kind of takeaway. That, you know, I, talks about the Housing Alliance and what we're going to do, uh, feel free to take it uh, and review it. But our formal uh, rollout is probably is going to be somewhere uh, in the middle of, Jan uh, of Jan January at a press conference that we're yet to be scheduled. Uh, this little diagram kind of summarizes it all as to what we're doing, how we're doing it. Uh, and it's a ladder, I, I, I say it's more like a pyramid. 
uh, where we work from the community, the broadest amount of folks in, uh, that we're, we're dealing with and serving, all the way to the individual uh, the homeowner or renter at, at the top. <clears throat> so at the community level, we're interested in doing uh, education. Uh, we need to make, make the community understand that uh, housing that's affordable is an economic development issue. It's not a, a social welfare issue. Uh, you know, our, uh, the quality of life in the business community in this, in Collier County is dependent on our workforce and depending on maintaining a quality workforce and the proper number of workforce. If we don't support that, we're going to lose our market share. So it's an economic development issue. So uh, we have a lot of NIMBY, uh, NIMBYism in, in the community, when affordable uh, uh, housing development or an apartment complex gets to build, we have, we have more people coming complaining about it to the Board of County Commissioners than supporting it. So what we want to do is turn that around uh, and from NIMBY to YIMBY, which is yes in my neighborhood. Uh, so that's kind of one of our, one of our, our missions on the community side. Uh, funders and donors, uh, you know, beating the bush looking for any, any way we can get any kind of funding, any kind of grants, any kind of, uh, whether it's uh, from federal, state, local funding, uh, philanthropic funding, you need dollars to, to build a, a affordable housing. There's always a gap, there's always a need to fill that gap, and it has to be filled by some form of, of I hate to use the word, but subsidy. Uh, working with developers, uh, we've had a wonderful partnership with McDowell, uh, and we have several other developers who are uh, interested in working uh, in, in the Collier County space on multifamily and home ownership that we're uh, probably by this time next year we'll ha um, be rolling out some other things as, uh, as Michael has, has told you. Uh, working with government uh, <clears throat> to deal with policy, uh, and probably right, the biggest policy issue right now is live local. Uh, how many are familiar with the Live Local Act? Okay. Uh, you can thank uh, our, uh, President, our Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo, uh, neighbor here, uh, and you'll see her on the screen in a few minutes. For She championed this piece of legislation, and it's probably the most dynamic legislation uh, in several decades to deal with affordable housing. Uh, a, a lot of complexity yet on how it's going to work and how it works in the field in reality. Uh, one of the things, uh, I, I also chair uh, the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee for, for the county, uh, and we have asked staff to uh, get together and have a workshop and a work forum for the various silos at the county level, the various departments at the county level, and the users of government, uh, whether it's a developer, a land use attorney, a uh, civil engineer, get together for, for a forum. Um, they've asked uh, if, if we could sponsor it, uh, so this is one of the first initiatives, the Housing Alliance, in partnership with ULI, will be uh, sponsoring that workshop sometime in February. And uh, Cormac Giblin from the uh, Director of Housing from the county is here today, and we uh, haven't yet worked out uh, the, all the uh, details, but that's something to be looking forward. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we want to do with, develop, with, with government. Uh, the whole purpose of that, that is to sit down with the users of, land, of, of Live Local and figure out where the obstacles are, where the barriers are, and what changes need to be made maybe in our, our, our land use codes, uh, in, in, our, in our, our way we develop and the way we deliver product. So we're all on kind of the same page as to how we can use Live Local to the best of our ability and not have, uh, have obstructions in its way. And finally, the, the user, the renter, the, and the, uh, 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 the home buyer. And that's why we're doing all of this. That's, we're, they're, they're the people who are our customers, they're the people who we're trying to serve, and they're the people who are important, as I said, important to our economy. Um, <clears throat> without uh, that workforce, uh, our, our quality of our life is going to go in, in a negative direction. So uh, that's what the Housing Alliance is about. That's why you should be excited about it. I'm excited about it. I've been uh, in the affordable housing space. Part of my career uh, for the past 30 years has been dealing with community revitalization and affordable housing. And I'm, uh, if I have an opportunity to talk about it, I always do. So I thank you for your patience. And at this time, I want to turn the my car keys are not going to change. <laughs> not going to change. This. It's not going. It is not going to work. Okay, next steps, next steps. Yes, I have one more here. Uh, okay. um, yeah, we're, I'm just ahead of myself. 
Uh, we're finalizing legal documents. Uh, as I said, within the next 30 days, uh, we're going to advertise for a CEO, uh, executive director. Mark, that's going out soon, Monday, Monday at the latest. Uh, it's out for the board. We're, we're going to establish our board of directors. Board of directors base is the Community Land Trust Board of Directors. Uh, they're the folks who are um, uh, going to be the base uh, board, and we're going to supplement that board to probably 13 or 15 folks. Uh, our formal launch, as I said, is about mi is going to be in mid-January, uh, and I talked to you already about co-hosting the, li the Live Local. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to establish a vetting process with the Community Foundation to, uh, to vet uh, uh, their impact fund, which uh, I mean, going to talk to you about. There we go. So thanks for letting me be here today and talk a little bit about what the Community Foundation has been up with, um, on housing the last five years we've been working on this. And you know, it started with grants to hunger and homeless and then to grants to what is now Warrior Homes of Collier. <laughs> I thought they've changed their names and many other housing organizations. But you know, you just kept hearing over and over and over and all of our data is showing us over and over that housing was definitely the problem we needed to be looking at. So. The staff spent time really um, looking at what are other communities around the United States doing, focused in on Austin, Atlanta, and Black, Hill, Black Hills to really figure out how are they dealing with this housing problem. Obviously, Collier is not the only community dealing with this. And it kept coming back to this concept, and I have called it a hub and probably will always call it a hub. A an organization that knows everything that's going on in this community because people would ask us like, okay, so the county's given all this, the deals to developers to have affordable housing. Are people actually in that housing five years later or what's happened? I don't know, you'd have to call the county and ask them that question. How many units are available? I don't know, you'll have to call somebody else and ask that question. So we decided really this concept of one organization having their arms around what's happening that we can call and you can call and we can know exactly what's going on. So that's where um, we had come to that realization as a staff. Then lo and behold, Ray and Michael and Steve walk in the door probably like two days later <laughs> with, with their agenda of what they wanted, which I don't even know if I ever actually got to your agenda because I said, hey, here's what we've come up with this concept of this hub, a big organization that can deal with all this housing, and they're all like, that's great. So the conversations began then with these organizations about how we bring them together, and that's when the consultants were hired, and the Community Foundation put 50,000 at the table for consultants, and we have now committed $200,000 for this next year to really help this organization financially um, move forward. So then the other thing we learned as we talked around the United States is that many community foundations have created this housing impact fund where money's raised, put into the fund, and um, working with the hub organization or now the Housing Alliance, um, we're figuring out which developers need money to help move them forward quicker. Because obviously, if you're going to do a development, you've got to have a lot of planning done, your zoning, all kinds of stuff done before you can go to the bank and actually get a mortgage to build. So what we're hearing from other communities is to have this um, fund in place where you can lend a million to three million. It, there, is an in, there is interest charged on it. It is a three-year payback at the most and you create this revolving loan fund for developers to help move things quicker um, in, and to, you know, to help the county be able to get their pieces in place quicker when, when uh, the developer is taken to them. So, so that is our hope, is to build this to a $20 million fund. We have so far commitments at $1.3 million. And you know, we actually haven't really rolled it out that far because we couldn't get too far ahead of the Housing Alliance. So people are like, well, what are you doing with this money? So um, we're excited that we have some money in it. I think we want to hit $3 million before we actually start doing any loans on this because that, that, that $3 million could actually be one loan that's going out to a developer. So we're excited that that is actually happening. Um, and why? 
you know, what, what else are we seeing? When we have done studies around Collier County, this was the latest needs assessment study that was done with the Schultz Foundation, Community Foundation, about 30 other nonprofit organizations. Number one thing, 65% of the 6,000 people that took the survey, housing. Um, so the community is well aware we have a problem and, uh, and there, you know, this will be going to the commissioners, it will be going to the council members. We're gonna have conversations about the fact that this continues to rate high. When we did the st same study five years ago, housing rated 45%. This time it rated 65%. And if you look at the next two pieces of this, managing growth and development, that was a huge increase. It was, last time it was like 30 some percent, now 63% because we need housing, but people are really concerned about how housing is happening in this community. And the fact that government needs to be well aware of what people wanna see um, as far as how development happens, where it happens, and then how we move people once we get developments. You know, How's transportation gonna be affected? These two things go very hand in hand. And then the last thing was environment, which again was almost a double increase from five years ago. And you'd go, well, cause Ian hit. Yeah, well guess what? Irma hit last time we did this study. So Ian hit this time. So I assure you in five years, be prepared. <laughs> cause this study will be done every five years and I feel like it's pretty much a target for a hurricane. But you know, as people looked at environment, it isn't just our environment, but it's also how does environment and um, housing come together? Preservation, green space, all of those things. So these top things, three issues kind of all wound together in this study. Um, so with that, um, I just wanna to touch base on another project that we started about four years ago after the last needs assessment study that said housing was you know, then still one of the number one issues. Um, Dick Schultz came to the Community Foundation after that study and said, hey, I'll, I'll put five million on the table if you put five million on the table, Community Foundation, and then um, the county has to put land in it. The county has to have skin in this game and Let's do a development around essential employees. Let's keep our police, teachers, nurses, EMT firefighters here in Collier County. So you'll see that area, it's kind of a L there, but you'll see that kind of back area is where the land is um, that was given to us for this project. Moorings Park um, came together with us on this. So Community Foundation, Moorings Park, and Schultz Foundation have raised the $10 million. County gave us, I think it ended up being about 23 acres in the end. And um, Rural Neighborhoods, which was a nonprofit, is a nonprofit developer, was um, chosen by the county to do this development. There'll be, um, I think about 350, is that on the next slide, Lindsay? Am I going, is it up there? Oh yeah, 372 in units uh, for essential employees. About 250 are essential employees. And then there's gonna be about 120 units for seniors and veterans. Um, that will be uh, kind of a phase two on this project. And hey, we have groundbreaking November 27th at 10 o'clock. So it's been a painfully long process um, and I would welcome all of you to attend because this is really um, somewhat of a unique project with all the philanthropic dollars that have gone into this with the county and you know, it was the golf course so that came with some unexpected uh, delays um, because of a variety of things that you deal with with golf courses. Um, other things around housing community foundation is, is working on is after Ian, obviously 27,000 households were affected here in Collier County. And um, we started to raise money as we always do through the Collier Comes Together when there's a disaster. We've raised about 10.1 million. So far 7.6 million's been out the door. And the community foundation, you know, in the beginning it's all crisis work that happens. It's food, it's, it's housing, it's water, it's all kinds of things, cleaning supplies, it's a variety in crisis, but then eventually you move to the mitigation, resilience, repairing of actual homes. And um, so um, a special thanks to Kathleen Pasadoma who helped uh, secure 4.9 million for us to work around lifting homes, to work around replacing trailers and lifting them. Um, this is all about getting stuff off the ground here in Collier County so that when the next flood comes, we are not having this effect that we've had this last time. So right now, um, uh, we're in that process. We've hired Penny Taylor, who's doing some work with us on this, and we have already done six trailers in Collier County, and again, they're up about four feet 
um, out of flood zone, uh, just finishing, we're ordering a new trailer right now for someone that's in the Everglades City. We're working with Everglades City long-term um, disaster group and we'll be lifting, we hope, up to 10 homes there. We lifted two last time. They were beautiful after, Ian. <laughs> no damage, everything was up high, and that's what has to happen, is we have to get ourselves in a position where people aren't looking for more housing after a hurricane because their houses didn't survive it. So doing a lot of work around that. And, um, you know, the big thing I think we have to deal with is policy issues on government level about how these developments happen, how quickly we can push things through. Um, and then, you know, that 1% sales tax ends, and 20 million of that was put aside in a land trust to buy land. If they're going to redo that sales tax, I think a lot of us need to be at the table really pushing that a big chunk of that money needs to be put aside into a land trust if we're gonna work with developers and actually make this thing happen around housing here. Um, I don't remember, but I, I think I heard we're about 10,000 short in affordable apartments or 17. homes. There was some number. 2017. 2017, so it's probably. It's yeah, it's probably greater now. So, um, I mean, just kind of a heads up on this 1% sales tax. The conversation is starting at uh, government level about this, and I think we've got to make sure that it's loud and clear where, if that sales tax continues on, after, if it get voted back in in 2024, what this is going to be um, paying for. And housing has to be a big piece of this. And, you know, other things, we're just going to continue to gather data and be able to see as we track this, are we making progress or not making progress as a community around housing? So, there you go. Thank you. Thanks. space. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. You can hear me? Well, you can generally hear me without a microphone anyway. So, uh, well, thank you for all of those comments. Um, we've actually moved through this fairly quickly. I'm going to get to... Uh, uh, Senate President Pasadomo's uh, video in a second here, but there will be an opportunity. I think we had intended to have uh, pen and paper on the table so you could write out questions, but because we'll have some, some time, we will have an opportunity in case there are some questions that you do have. One interesting thing that Eileen brought up that um, I didn't focus on and, and really we hadn't talked about, we've talked a lot about development, which is typically new construction, uh, but when you hear things about uh, disaster recovery, but there's also an aspect of that of resiliency and redevelopment and preservation. And so preservation and redevelopment are also aspects of maintaining uh, housing affordability um, or repurposing spaces that are already set up that have infrastructure. So those are two key components of what we're gonna be talking about in this upcoming year as well, part of the Alliance. So just keep in mind, we're not, uh, because as you saw, there's, there's concerns regarding growth. <laughs> there's, we can't just continuously develop new. We have to find other ways uh, in which to do this. And that's a part of what the Live Local really is, this idea of being able to utilize commercial and industrial spaces that have appropriate infrastructure already in place. And maybe they're not as needed for, for commercial and so are there opportunities there to utilize that for uh, housing development? And, and that's kind of what one of the big focal points of Live Local. So without further ado, uh, as I mentioned, we wanted to honor uh, Senator Pasadomo with this Housing Champion Award for 2023. I, I know she's received a number of them, but uh, unfortunately she wasn't able to be here, but she did send along this video uh, with a message and some more details about the bill. <laughs> Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to send this video message to tell you how grateful I am for the honor of receiving the Housing Champion Award. I'm so thankful for all of your advice and input over the years. This award really belongs to all of us. When I moved to Naples almost 45 years ago, the community was talking about the lack of housing for our workers. It was a problem then and remains a persistent problem today in many areas of our state. The good news is Florida's new Live Local Act, a comprehensive statewide workforce housing strategy, took effect in July. With your advice and input, Live Local tackles the complex issue of housing from all angles. 
incentivizing private sector investment, superfunding state and local affordable housing programs, providing new avenues for zoning, encouraging mixed-use developments in latent commercial areas, and enhancing public access to information. It is clear that the broad appeal of the free state of Florida has impacted our population and our housing needs. Countless families and business owners have fled high-tax, lockdown states in search of a better life. As our state continues to grow, our Live Local Act will make sure Floridians can live close to good jobs, schools, hospitals, and other critical centers of our communities that fit comfortably in their household budgets, no matter the stage of life or income. With your continued help, the Live Local approach to workforce housing will shut down affordable housing stereotypes and create attainable housing options needed by the majority of our workforce, the backbone of Florida's economy. Floridians are ready to live local and to build their lives and raise their families in the heart of the communities they serve. Thank you again. Just wanted to point out, I did put some business cards out, but uh, if you, uh want to reach out after this event, individually engage with me. I'm always happy to schedule meetings, conversations. The email is on the screen, michael at collierhousing.com. But again, you also have some business cards out front. There are opportunities to get involved. The Collier County Community Land Trust is a membership organization. We just had our annual meeting this morning uh, before we uh, convened for the, for the breakfast buffet. Uh, so, you know, as far as, as we move forward, the land trust will still be a part of the alliance. It will still stay in its, in its membership form. So feel free to reach out if you're interested in getting involved uh, in that capacity.